Okay, I've got two nice masking tape lines here showing me where I walk to go in front of the projector. Um, but if I lose track of that and I'm doing it, make suitable hand gestures, kind of like, out of the way. Okay, I'm going to start with um, the words of um, a poem that you might be familiar with. It's called Invictus. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds me and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. I wonder whether you relate to that. Those are the words, as I said, of this poem Invictus, written by the English poet William Ernest Henley in 1875. And I think they capture something of the ethos of our talk title. Does becoming a Christian mean giving up control of my life? Because if it does, there's something very firmly lodged inside each one of us, something that I think William Henley brings powerfully to the surface in his poem, that wants to shout back, no way. I will not give up control of my life. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Before we get too far into probing the merits of that reaction, though, I want to spend a bit of time just probing the merits of the question itself. What does it presuppose to ask, does becoming a Christian mean giving up control of my life? It presupposes that we already have control, right? And that's a pretty big assumption to make. Of course, it sounds very plausible sitting where we're sitting right now. If you'll allow me a sweeping generalization uh, for a moment, I think our culture, the culture of the university that most of us are part of, is constructed on the plausibility of this idea. Oxford is the place that you reach by taking control of your future, by aiming high, by deploying all your talents, nailing your grades, nailing your interview. And it's a place that promises us then the future that we want, opportunity and influence as long as we keep nailing our grades and nailing our interviews. The whole world is at our feet. We have, if we have the ambition and the stamina required uh, to reach out and take it, we're in control. But all of that starts to look a bit secondhand, I think, as soon as we step out beyond the confines of this particular bubble. What about the people who aimed high and deployed all their talents in an effort to get here and didn't make it? Do we really think we're so different from them? I've served on interviewing panels for Oxford undergraduates several times. I can assure you every year we reject students who believe just as strongly as you do in that narrative of control. And what about people who didn't even have the opportunity to try? Does becoming a Christian mean giving up control of my life is a good question, but it's important to realize that only a tiny proportion of the world's population can even begin to relate to it. Before we get too high and mighty about control as some kind of basic human right, we need to remember that most humans don't and can't exercise that right, and people like us are actually a large part of the reason why. But even without casting the net so widely, I think that uh, cracks in this illusion of control have been appearing a little bit closer to home lately, haven't they? Think about COVID. I think it's brought and is bringing out the best of us in many ways. We've made sacrifices to keep one another safe. That's a brilliant thing to do. But we've also learned that our plans and aspirations are incredibly fragile, haven't we? We simply assume that we'd be able to be there for our friends and family and that they'd be able to be there for us before all this happened. We assume we had that covered and then suddenly we didn't. We assume we'd be able to reach out and take the opportunities that generations before ours reached out and took. Holidays, team sports, internships, jobs, and then suddenly we couldn't. We suddenly discovered that all the little minutiae of our lives, the things we really enjoy, the things we like to buy, the things we like to eat, all stand at the end of these kind of absurdly long chains of uh, cause and effect that are basically completely out of our control. We might want to shout back to the void, I am the master of my fate, but it hasn't really worked out like that in practice, has it? 
In John chapter 15, if you come to the talk later on tonight, you'll hear Jesus likening his disciples to branches in a vine. It's an image of radical dependence. Branches do amazing things. Branches produce amazing fruit. But they only do it by virtue of connection to the larger plant. They're not the masters of their own fate. They're not the captains of their own souls. They're contingent. So does becoming a Christian mean giving up control of my life? Before we even get there, I think it involves acknowledging the fact that we don't actually have control of our lives in the first place. When I was an undergrad at a certain institution located somewhat in the Ipswich direction from here, um, the culture of that university was very similar. And though I didn't think I actually had much control over my academic future, I spent most of my years as an undergrad thinking that I was you know, just desperately trying to cling on to the coattails of my peers and hoping I wouldn't get chucked out. But I still had this kind of unshakable confidence that doors would open if I pushed them, that there was a future out there that I could make things happen. And in some ways that worked out. I got a great job working as a designer in a studio in London. It was what I dreamed of since I was a boy. But then 18 months after leaving uni, my lungs collapsed while I was just sitting at my desk in the studio one day. I was blue lighted to hospital and I wasn't fully well till I was 35. I'd be happy to talk more about that in Q&A if you want to, or you know, just to chat about that afterwards if that would help. But I summarize it here just now to show why I am passionately trying to convince you that you're not in control. It's a pleasing illusion, especially when everyone around you believes the same thing. But it is an illusion. It isn't actually sustainable in real life. But you might say, that's not actually what the question we've been posed here means. It's not talking about giving up control of um, uh, uh, where I was born or whether I get ill. It's talking about giving up control of personal choice. Even if we don't have control over all of the um, ups and downs of this pandemic, we still are in control to a degree of what we eat, of what causes we support, of what we're passionate about, of who we date. Does becoming a Christian mean giving up control of that? And that's a really good question. And we're going to get there. But even before we go there, we need to ask ourselves just a little bit more carefully what's going on in terms of the underlying presuppositions. I wonder, are you a determinist? I'm one of the table leaders at The Search, which is this brilliant discussion club that meets on Monday nights at Costa uh, to examine the claims of Christianity. I highly recommend it to you. And this is something that I hear on my table year over year. I'm not a Christian. I'm an atheist. I don't think there's a God or any higher power or purpose in this world. What there is is what we can see, what we can measure. We're complicated biological machines and nothing more. And I've got a lot of sympathy for that perspective because that's what I was brought up to believe. But the necessary consequence of it is another problem for our talk title. Does becoming a Christian mean giving up control of my life? The problem is that personal pronoun, my what does it even mean to say there is a me if everything I am and experience is reducible to the movement of molecules and the dissipation of heat? If my whole consciousness is just a kind of an elaborate trick being played on me to distract me from the terrifying reality that at bottom there is no purpose, there's no good, there's no bad at all. And if my daily experiences, though I cherish them, are actually just consequences of blind, unaccountable biological mathematics. There is no me. I may feel passionate about things. I may even be motivated to passionately try and persuade you to feel them too. And that's an interesting phenomenon. But it isn't anything more than that. Merely interesting. Determinists can't claim Christianity faces some deficit of control here. If you're a determinist, there's no argument against becoming a Christian in this question at all, I think. If you're really a determinist, why not try it? Maybe that's where your genes are leading you. If you have a hard time living this out, though, and I think most of us do, perhaps you'd rather call yourself an indeterminist. This is where most of us land in practice. This is how we justify many of our most important institutions, democracy, judiciary. The whole thing is based on the assumption that our choices are significant and we're accountable for them, right? Indeterminism is the idea that the whole of us is greater than the sum of those biological parts. 
is the idea that ideas and emotions and personal convictions are not completely constrained by our genetic makeup or what we have for breakfast. When I go to Pizza Express and I choose that pizza with the induja sausage on it, it's a great pizza, that's a real statement of the collection of ideas and experiences that I rightly call me. It isn't completely determined by my genes or by my past preferences or by my present influences. It's a genuine production of my own will in the moment. But the problem now is that undetermined choices like that are pretty hard to tell apart from tossing a coin. If you're truly the master of your own fate, if you're the captain of your own soul, you can make choices like that till you're blue in the face, but you can't give them the significance that control seems to need. Things are good because you define them to be good. Well, good for you. But that doesn't stop the master of her own fate who lives next door to you coming to completely different conclusions about what's good, say about how loud she plays ABBA at 3 a.m. in the morning, that blow your control completely out of the water. You see, ironically, the place you want to be if you really want your choices to have actual shareable significance in this world is exactly the kind of place that our talk title tells us you will lose control in the kind of world where God or something like God gives everything an overarching meaning without undermining real human agency. Proving that would take us well beyond the scope of this talk, so we're going to kind of drop it there. But for now, I just want to highlight the uncomfortable reality behind the question that we're asking here. We can't give up something we don't already have. We may be worried about becoming a Christian and what it would involve, but I think if we've really got anything to lose here, we've already embraced some of the most important concepts of the Christian worldview. But um, we still haven't really got into the guts of the question yet, have we? This is kind of typical Oxford style, question the question and see. I hope that nobody notices, but actually I, I have noticed. Um, we're halfway through and it's time to, to, to deal with it squarely. Does becoming a Christian mean giving up control of my life? Well, despite the realisation that the whole Oxford experience is kind of deceiving us into believing we're much more in control than we really are, despite the fact that if we were really consistent determinists or indeterminists, we'd realise pretty much everything we think is not so under control as we'd like it to be, the answer to this question is still yes. Becoming a Christian does mean giving up control of your life. And that's the big takeaway this lunchtime. I know it's totally countercultural. I know it flies in the face of everything that Disney have told us until we were 12 and that our favourite bands and media influences have told us ever since. But this is what every Christian in this room believes. We believe that we're better off handing over the control of our lives to Jesus Christ than controlling them ourselves. But that obviously requires some explanation, doesn't it? Let's talk first about what it doesn't mean. Embracing Jesus as the Lord of my life doesn't mean giving up agency. That was the problem with determinism, wasn't it? That in the end, I was no longer a significant agent. But in the Bible, we find a totally different picture of reality. The Bible tells us that as human beings, we're made in God's image and that a life of surrender to him is a life where our choices really matter. The scary thing is that they actually matter so much. The Bible dignifies choice. It doesn't allow us to wave responsibility away with that kind of classic postmodern sleight of hand, you know, my choices just have to be right for me. Nobody likes it when our prime minister behaves like that. The Bible simply insists on turning the same scrutiny back on ourselves. Becoming a Christian is a step into an accountable world where there's a difference between good and bad and where our, cho our choices articulate kind of alignment with one or other of those options to some degree, depending on what the choice is. Becoming a Christian involves giving up control, for sure, but it also involves being taken seriously as a choice-making individual. And in the end, I think all of us want that, don't we? We do want to be taken seriously as choice-making individuals. Christianity provides the infrastructure to make that real. The next thing giving up control doesn't mean is giving up rationality. Again, this is a common question at the search. Doesn't becoming a Christian involve checking in my brain at the door? Isn't it all a matter of faith, a leap in the dark, jettisoning reason and embracing mystery? But once again, there are all kinds of problems with this, not least the fact that the Bible itself thinks faith is eminently rational. 20 years ago this year, I asked my wife, Ruth, to marry me. It was an act of faith, especially for her. 
Neither of us knew what the future would hold. Neither of us knew how our circumstances would change or how actually we ourselves would change over, over the years. But it wasn't a leap in the dark. We already knew each other well. And extrapolating from that experience gave us the confidence to go for it. Faith in God is like that. It extrapolates from experience. It's not some special talent like perfect pitch or rolling your R's that some people can do and other people just can't. It's a faculty that all of us are exercising all the time. And the Bible encourages us to exercise it. Giving up control doesn't mean saying, you know, I hereby lay down the right to think carefully and critically about things that I hear from now on. The Bible says some extraordinary stuff. It says things that deserve careful, critical reflection and will do for a lifetime. But if you open your mind for just a moment to the possibility that its basic premise might be true, that there really might be a God out there, the consequences that flow from that are eminently rational. Becoming a Christian doesn't mean laying down rationality. It means laying down the self-sufficiency that says, I have all the answers I need already. And there's one last thing that giving up control doesn't mean. Um, and I would say this as someone who is, um, you know, has worked as a creative for a large part of my life. It doesn't mean giving up passion and creativity. For some of us, becoming a Christian just sounds like the most deathly thing imaginable. We're sealing ourselves into this bland kind of Ned Flanders world where nothing new or interesting ever happens. But nothing could be further from the truth. Just think about the possibility that you're being presented with here this week if you wouldn't yet call yourself a Christian. You're being presented with the possibility that every atom in this universe and every atom in you was made by a real, powerful, intelligent, accessible being. That's a mind-blowing idea. You're being presented with the possibility that he's the missing term in all our equations, that he's the missing reference point in all our artistic endeavors, that he deserves a seat at, every, at the table at every conversation that takes place in this university, and that every one of those conversations would be unimaginably enriched by his presence in it. That may sound like science fiction, and each of us has to carefully weigh the evidence for or against it, but I defy anyone in this room to claim that that's not exciting, that that's not pregnant with massive intellectual and creative possibilities. These are the ideas that have stimulated some of the greatest innovators in the history of human culture. So let's not take refuge in this peculiar modern idea that laying down control would mean laying down an interesting, stretching, edgy life. Living under the functional assumption that I am God sounds far less stretching and edgy to me. It sounds actually really fairly cushy and convenient. But even if becoming a Christian doesn't mean giving up agency and rationality and passion and creativity, it does mean giving up self-sufficiency. And that's the sense in which I think it's true to say that a Christian has to surrender control. All of us, I think, have an innate desire to be in charge of our lives. We want to have the final say about what's right and wrong and good and true for us. We think we're the ones who've got our best interests at heart, right? So it makes sense that we should make those calls. We think we're the ones who can call the shots, who can write the rules, who can wear the crown. And it's that that has to go if we want to follow Christ. Not because he's some kind of cosmic killjoy, not because he wants an army of automatons doing his bidding without process, he protest, heaven forbid. He wants us to hand the crown back to him because it weighs 10,000 tons. And if we take it on our heads, it will crush us to death in the end. Turning back to John's gospel, there's a poignant incident in Jesus' life that illustrates this principle. We've got these little blue booklets here. If you want to follow with me, just turn to page 42. We're going to look at a little section from John chapter 13, where the author, John, is recalling events that took place on the night before Jesus died. There was a dinner, and John, the author, was there. And in fact, he was an uncomfortably prominent character in the drama. Because although on the surface this last meal is very traditional, it actually was a celebration of the Jewish Passover, Jesus broke all the normal protocols. In traditional Jewish meals like this, the seating plan was supposed to be a bit like it is at a contemporary wedding, with the oldest, most important people at the top table and the least important, on the, uh, the least important people on the least important seats. 
But as far as we can tell, on this occasion, Jesus seated the most important person, the oldest, the most outspoken member of the group of disciples, their leader, Peter, in the lowest place. And he seated our author, John, who tradition tells us was the youngest disciple right next to him. So right next to Jesus, that is. And then as if all that wasn't enough, Jesus himself then got up from the table, took off his outer clothing and took a basin of water and a towel like a slave. He got down on his knees and washed the feet of his disciples one by one. And obviously, as we imagine him working his way, this is a kind of U-shaped table, we call it a triclinium. He's working his way round from the, high, the most prominent seats down to the lowest. He, he's coming to Peter, and you get the sense that by the time he gets there, Peter is just about ready to blow a gasket. This whole thing is too much for him, and you can see it there in verse six. He says, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And I hope we can feel some sympathy for him here. This is not the way the Passover meal was supposed to go. And Peter didn't think Jesus should be picking up this menial task. No way, he says. I don't want you to serve me. Perhaps he's thinking it should be the other way around. Perhaps he's thinking actually John ought to step down from his position and come and serve them both. But listen to Jesus' response. Because it cuts right to the heart of our own situation here, I think. Jesus says, Peter, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Do you get that? unless you let me do this for you, unless you renounce your self-confidence to the point where you realize that I have to do even this lowest, dirtiest thing for you, you'll receive no benefit from me at all. For all your leadership gifts, for all your boldness, you will receive no benefit at all, unless you let me wash you. And I think Jesus looks out at us here today with that same challenging, compassionate, message. This is a room full of high achievers. We're all people with a claim to be sitting on the top table. What is Oxford if it isn't the top table in our culture? We might be slightly embarrassed to admit that, but that's the truth, isn't it? But you see that that's what makes it so difficult for us to come and receive the liberation that is on offer here. Being a high high achiever is a spiritual straitjacket. We're convinced We don't need washing. Or if we do, that we can take care of it ourselves. But Jesus says, no. You've got to get go of that self-sufficiency. Don't place so high a premium on your unconquerable soul. You've got to get that crown off your head and lay it at my feet. If you don't, it'll kill you. So here's the central message of this talk. For all the important parts of our lives as thoughtful, responsible, creative individuals that Christianity affirms, that I would argue Christianity actually enables, it does require us to give up control. It requires us to give up our self-sufficiency, our self-sovereignty. And I recognize that for many of us, that will sound dangerous. Isn't this, in fact, the heart of the problem with religion, historically? that people have given up control of their lives to statements of faith and to the priests who police them and have ended up being manipulated and abused? The answer, I'm afraid, is yes. Although I think you could say the same thing about politics and personality cults just as truly. It is possible for manipulative individuals to insert themselves between people venturing to surrender control and the benevolent God who alone deserves it. I'm afraid I have some personal experience of this and it's a grotesque distortion of Christianity when it happens in a church. But we also have to think about the end game here. What's the logical conclusion of this argument that we won't lay down control of our lives because we can see all the ways that it could go wrong and maybe in our own experience, we've actually felt the pain of it going wrong. Holding on to control, as I hope I've already shown you, is hardly heading for a good outcome. And if the risks of surrender are always going to outweigh the potential benefits, we need to understand that that will have consequences for us too. In our role as teammates, friends, life partners, we will be horribly disabled in those situations if we can't get through this. Like it or not, flourishing as a human being requires us to entrust ourselves to others. There's scope to be hurt in every one of these interactions, but also scope to give and receive incredible joy. There's no way around the fact that handing back the sovereignty of our lives to God feels scary. In some ways, I think it feels downright wrong. 
I'm no believer in the idea that we should follow Jesus because everything that he says has some kind of wonderful immediate ring of truth. You know, we read his words in the Bible and suddenly we think, yeah, that's exactly what I think. Yeah, sign me up. Some of it's like that, but not all of it. Love your enemies makes a good t-shirt slogan, but it's hard to swallow once you've been really wronged. Loving God with all your heart and soul doesn't always seem like such a great idea when you're just desperate for someone to notice and love you. But the thing I want to stress as I close here is that that fear doesn't have to have the final word as we weigh this challenge, whether or not to say yes to Jesus. I'm going to show you some uh, pictures now to try and illustrate this point. Let's just get my pencil. Um, I wonder whether you know where this picture was taken. So let's see. Get up here. Anybody know where that is? So that is the entrance to the university parks just behind Linica College. So the southeast side. And you can see through, you're going on into the park there down by the river. Um, I'm going to tell you a story about walking my dog down there. Here he is. This is Nornor. Um, and it's a picture of him on the Silly Isles, which is a favorite place of ours. Um, I'll just indulge you with a few other Nornor pictures. Sweetie. Some people say he looks like me. I can't think why. Um, anyway, um, this is a, a story about him when he was a puppy. <laughs> um, and um, I, I, I took him out here to the university parks. It's our local place to walk. We live right in the center of the city. So I took him up there on the lead and walked him up to this gate. And he wouldn't go in. I was like, come on, no, no. Like, here we are. This is, this is great. This is the parks. Like, no, no, I'm not even going to do it. Let me, let me try and explain to you what's going on in his mind. Um, so I'll draw it. So this is the gate. Okay, let's get this right. So it looks like this, and the gate goes like that, okay? Do you know how these things work? The, you know, the basic gist of it, I think we call it a kissing gate here in the UK. Um, this bit can go backwards and forwards, and so the idea is you walk into the space, flip the gate back, and then walk on into the park, and it's there to stop the evils of things like students cycling um, in, the, in the park. So... Um, uh, so imagine this now from the dog's perspective. Okay, so we're going to kind of zoom in and try and picture Nornor entering or thinking about entering the gate. Every time I draw him like this, he looks like a mouse. Oh, better give him a collar, he'll look less mouse-like. Great, okay. So when Nornor comes to this, it's kind of like, huh? Like, you want me to walk in there? You know, the, if you go back to it, now you can see what he's thinking. It looks like a cage. It looks like I'm walking him into a situation where there's no way out. And I think that really illustrates for me what it feels like to let our control kind of go and trust Jesus. It is going to feel forbidding. It is going to feel restrictive. And it isn't just like that at the start. It's like that the whole way along. As you go along the Christian life, you find that as Jesus beckons you further up and further in, you keep hitting these thresholds where you don't actually know that the next thing that's going to happen is you're going to be off the lead and chasing squirrels in the grass. It feels like it's awful. Like, why would I want to do that? And the challenge is for us to trust and say yes to him at each stage. But as we come to the end of this week, I hope you've seen enough of Jesus now to realize that it might be worth the risk. Norna went through that gate in the end, not because he liked it, but because he trusted me. And now, of course, he runs straight through and hardly notices what's going on because he knows what's on the other side. Well, I would urge you to do the same. Jesus has led me into all kinds of places I would never have chosen to go in my walk with him. He's led me through illness, loneliness, disappointed hopes. With or without him, your journey will lead you through similar situations. But with all my heart, I can say I wouldn't have missed a minute of it. Because Jesus has been everything that he promised in my own experience. And I commend him to you. Jesus is the place of safe surrender. I think all of us are desperately longing for in the end. The place where we can stop scrambling to make everything as we would wish it be, because we're home. That's all I've got. I think we're going to have some questions now. Hello, friends at the back. Yes, I am on. Thank you so much, Neil. So just to reiterate, if you need to go for a lecture or anything, 
feel free to head out. But we are going to have about 10 to 15 minutes of questions now. So first one to start, which kind of links a little bit to what you were saying about the Bible. It's a two-part question. Do we have to believe everything that's in the Bible? And then link to that, how do you choose which rules from the Bible to follow and which ones to ignore? Good questions. Yeah, those are really, really good questions. I can really relate to this. So I, I hinted as I was going through the, the talk that I don't come from a Christian background. So I remember this was just incredibly alien to me when I started. I didn't really know anything about the Bible at all. I remember going to my first few Christian meetings and, and seeing people who I knew sing. And it was like, whoa, that's really weird. Um, so I can definitely relate to that kind of what would it look like to do this. Um, I, I would encourage you to start with Jesus. Um, so as you engage with the Bible story, I think that that is its center point. It's kind of the Bible self-consciously organized around this point when God himself is going to say, OK, here I am. This is what I'm about. And then what you find is, is actually Jesus isn't a kind of standalone item in the Bible, but pretty much everything that Jesus says is interacting with the rest of the Bible. And so the journey works as a series of kind of adventures in concentric circles. You, you begin by saying, oh, I wonder whether I could trust Jesus with this difficult thing that he says. And you try and you find actually much to your surprise, he knows you much better than you think you know yourself. Um, and what he says, even though maybe it feels like walking into, you know, that, that kind of a, you know, cage uh, initially, you find that really it's freedom. And so you arrive back at the start point thinking, okay, Jesus, like I've got greater confidence in you now. So then you notice him actually laying his own life, you know, um, you know, surrendering his own direction to things that you read elsewhere in the Bible. He takes parts of the Old Testament and says, okay, I'm happy to live under that. So then you find yourself saying, okay, well, I, you know, I, I feel bound to give that a try myself and so off you go again on an, on a, a, an expanding circle gradually further out finding that lo and behold Jesus really does know what he's talking about and uh, however forbidding or difficult it might seem that the whole of it is a space designed for us to see ourselves and God in proper perspective and uh, yeah find the life that we're supposed to live so I guess maybe within that question is the second question of are there parts of the Bible which we can ignore in our lives? Are there parts that we can ignore? Um, I haven't found one yet. Um, <laughs> there, I mean, there are one or two parts of the Bible that I think it's important to realize when you open the Bible, you're doing something that is very, very different from anything that we do in, in, in most kind of you know, fields of normal life. If you're an English student, someone throws you a copy of Gawain and the Green Knight. You, you, you're like, whoa, okay, this is terra incognita. This was written 500 years ago. Like, I don't get this. Well, that's 500 years ago. There's nothing in the Bible that was written anything less than 1900 years ago. Um, some of it was written 3,500 years ago. Um, so there are parts of it where you've, there, there's a lot of kind of, like, you've got to really invest to try and think yourself back into that world and grasp what it could be and inevitably there are some things where there are illusions and illustrations that makes that, that don't make much sense to us now we know we're not shepherds and so on but um you'd be surprised what you can do in terms of actually thinking your way back into the context and then it starts to really come alive great thank you our second question um what about things which we find happiness in that the bible says we shouldn't do isn't that losing control yeah yeah that is losing control exactly um, so, and I think I would, again, just appeal to my, my illustration at the end with, with taking my, my dog into the park. Um, I just don't want to minimize that at all. Um, that, that, that becoming a Christian does ask things of us that don't feel right. That it, it really isn't, it's, it's not like inviting your friend to G&Ds. Everything on the G&Ds menu feels right. It's just a question of which one you should choose. Um, but, but inviting your friend to come and be a Christian is one of these things where we really are going to be asked to, to say no to some things which we have grown used to saying yes to and they feel right to us. And there is no way of discovering God's wisdom in that part of our life without actually em embracing it. You can kind of rationalize that, but the only way through is, is through. Um, so I think it's one of these things where you have to look at Jesus and think, does this guy deserve a chance? Um, Jesus actually says this in John 7. There's a really striking moment where some people come up to him and they ask him, um, you know, uh, are you, they're asking essentially the question, question most of us are asking it, you know, are you, are you a for real kind of voice from outside, a voice from beyond just the hubbub of human voices? You know, are you actually really God speaking to us? And um, maybe you're expecting some kind of advanced philosophical answer from him, but actually what he says is try it, try it. Um, 
put the things that I say into practice and then you'll find out whether they come from God or whether I speak on my own is pretty much exactly what he says in John 7, 17. So I would really encourage you to that, you know, Christianity ultimately is not just something to be interrogated philosophically. It's totally, it, it totally sustains that. And some of us, I've got some theologians in the room here who make a living out of this. Um, you know, the, the, you can drill and keep drilling and you could do it from a lifetime. Um, but actually Christianity at, at, at its essence is designed to be in, interrogated experientially. Um, you know, it's not designed to look at from a distance. And if we just look at it from a distance, we'll never get it. And on that vein of try it then, what can we do to help us giving up control, help us in giving up control? Is there anything we can do? Yeah, it'd be interesting to know a bit more what the question behind the question is there. I think, so it maybe is slightly different depending on whether you would perceive yourself to be somewhat on the outside looking in or whether you're already in and struggling. Um, I think I said to you, um, that journey of laying down control is an ongoing one. It's not something that miraculously you say, yes, I want to become a Christian and now it's all plain sailing. Absolutely not. Um, but I think, so if you are, you would see yourself as kind of, you know, I'm not yet a Christian, but I'm definitely interested and want to find out more about this. Um, I would really encourage you to read, read a gospel right through. Take one of the John's gospels that you've got here on your seats with you. And just, you, you've got to get to the point where you feel Jesus is, is, is worthy of your trust. And you wouldn't do that with anyone you hardly knew. Um, so, so read it. But I would also, and this would feel super weird, and I remember this exact thing happening to me, but I would, I would urge you to pray. Um, and if you've never done that before, that will feel like the oddest thing. Um, but th that prayer, look, look, Jesus, if you're really real, you're hearing this. <laughs> so here I am. Um, you know, I've said to people many times at this kind of point in the conversation where they're interested, I would say, pick up the phone. Pick up the phone. If there's someone on the other end, you'll know about it. <laughs> you know, it won't necessarily be, boom, Jesus appears at the end of your bed. Um, but um, I think every Christian in this room would testify to the fact that as you start to engage on that journey, um, that God will make himself apparent to you and things will start to change. And um, talk to your Christian friends about that. I would love to chat to anyone about that afterwards. Yeah, I was going to say, it's worth saying if you are the person that asked that question or you have similar questions and you're experiencing something right now, Neil will be around afterwards. You can chat to him, also me or anyone in a Who Do You Say I'm um, stewarding jumper or t-shirt. Yeah. We're also, more than happy to chat. Also, merciless plug, but um, <laughs> come to the search on Monday. So me and a bunch of other people who do this a lot better than I do all lead tables on, on Monday nights, every night in term time. So come and grab a coffee and come and ask your questions. I think we do have time for a couple more questions now. So does it really matter if we follow the rules or not? Doesn't God forgive all our sins anyway? Yeah, good question. I mean, I, I think maybe the presupposition there is that Christianity boils down to following rules. And I just don't think that that's actually true. So again, that's one of the things that's it's easy to kind of stereotype Christianity as that from the outside. But Christians would say that actually the experience of, of, of following Christ is freedom. Um, and, you know, there are certain rules that are liberating, aren't there? Um, you know, I use this illustration sometimes. It's a really silly one. It's probably because I have young children. Um, but, you know, if you're a train and you're running along the tracks, one way to interpret the tracks is as restriction. And you think to yourself, oh, look, everybody else is having a great time. Like, here I am on the tracks, but look at those sheep and cows and stuff down in the field. Wow, I wish I was one of those. You know, one day you're zooming along the track and you think, oh, I'm going to speed up a little bit here, topple off, roll down into the field, end up upside down and go, moo. And that's as good as it gets, isn't it? Because now you're upside down in a field, like the destiny for you as a train is to be a rusty hulk. You know, a train demonstrates the very best thing that it can do by going along the rails, right? Speed you know, capacity to serve people and take people to interesting places and to explore, you know, to be shiny and fast and have the wind in your, whatever the equivalent of hair is, you know, if you're a train. The analogy is starting to break down here. But you see that, okay, so you could interpret the rails as rules, but the rails are actually a pathway to excitement, creativity, service. You know, don't we want excitement, creativity and service? I do. That, that's been my experience of being a Christian. It's just a complete delight to make things, imagine new things, go to new places intellectually and, and physically with, with God as your, you know, um, uh, your, your captain, your light. Um, so I would just so heartily commend that to you and that doesn't feel to me like some kind of ghastly, form-filling, box-ticking, HMLC kind of uh, faith. Yeah. 
Great. I'm not sure the person who asked that question was expecting to see you pretending to be a train, pretending to be a cow. Anytime. But... Honestly, I'm really up for that. <laughs> <laughs> for our final question, um, so somebody's saying, if I've decided to become a Christian, how do I then decide what church to attend? Great question. Um, yeah, there are, there are a whole range of brilliant churches in Oxford. So, you know, I, I just I commend, find yourself a Bible teaching church. Um, uh, you know, if you've got a friend who's invited you along, go with your friend um, because they'll be able to help you get settled. Um, you, you just want to make sure that Jesus is at the center of it. This whole thing is a pursuit of him. You know, if you find yourself in a church which is all about the pastor, then just say thanks, but no thanks. Um, you know, the Bible is very clear with us. Jesus is to become more, we're to become less. So if you find yourself in an environment where he's being honored, where his word is being opened, um, and when there's a, a mood of submission to him, then get stuck in. Great. Thank you very much, Neil. So that's all we have time for today. Um, but yes, don't rush off if we didn't answer your question. Neil will be here, plenty of other people around if you want to ask your questions, and we'll be open all afternoon as a study space, art gallery, free tea and coffee. So feel free to stick around. Um, just to plug to you what we have going on the rest of the day. If you want to know more about these kinds of issues, we have a talk at 6.30 aimed at tackling big questions from a non-Western perspective. So we've called it our international track, but anybody is welcome. Um, we're looking at today how good is good enough, how much does it take to please God, which probably particularly resonates with us as Oxford students who are always trying to be good enough every day. And then this evening at 8pm, we've got a final talk from Andy Croft on... What if I could find true joy?